what do you like? Tell me what you like. There's value in that because it almost gives the brain like a vacation, right? Holistic health is completely underappreciated, but so critical. Eating whole foods and the key is just to find something that you really enjoy. Welcome to the NAMP Nourishing You podcast. I'm Kristen Burkett. And I'm Diana Wally. We're your hosts for NAMP's podcast dedicated to connecting holistic health enthusiasts with each other to share practical information from the holistic wellness space for enhanced vitality. Diana and I are master nutrition therapists, board certified in holistic nutrition with private practices and an online joint venture that supports clients and practitioners as they strive to reach their full potential. We're honored to be hosting this podcast for NAMP and connecting our listeners with the latest in holistic wellness. If you enjoyed today's show, help us out by commenting below, liking this video and subscribing to the channel to help us spread the word. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Nourishing You podcast. Today, we're excited to talk with Susan Niebergall about the right way to lose weight. Susan is the owner of Susan Niebergall Fitness and co-coach in the Syatt Fitness Inner Circle. She's an online strength coach with a passion for helping people change their lives by getting as strong as possible and finally losing the stubborn fat they never thought they could lose. Susan is in her early 60s and has made every fitness and nutrition mistake in the book. She's changed everything in her 50s and now is on a mission to empower people so they can do the same. Her message is, it's never too late to move better, feel better, lose fat, and build muscle. Change is possible at any age. Susan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you all. And Susan, as I was saying before we started recording, it's so good to meet you in person because I've been following you on social media and listening to your podcast. So I'm just really, really excited to get to talk to you today about this really important subject. And I know our audience is really excited to get to know you as well. So we'd love to hear more about your journey to health and fitness. Tell us how it all began. Yeah, well, you know, it's so interesting. I am just a typical average middle-aged woman who has been a yo-yo dieter for, you know, decades. Um, I started back in the late eighties, early nineties in that time frame, doing Jenny Craig when it first came out. And, um, I lost a considerable amount of weight with Jenny Craig, but, um, like a lot of people who do pre-planned meal plans like that, you don't really learn a lot. You just kind of eat the food that they give you and you lose weight. And then it's kind of like, now what do I do? I mean, I don't, I didn't know how to, to, to carry that over into real life. Um, so I gained and lost increments of that 50 for the next, I don't know, two, three decades. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my fifties where, and I had just become a, about four years earlier, I'd become a fitness professional myself. And I, um, I just was in my bathroom one day and I remember looking down, looking at my belly and going, what has happened to me? Like I, I, it, I felt like overnight I gained this belly that we hear so many middle-aged women talk about. And then it started dawning on me how, oh, menopause, perimenopause, that's what this is. I get it. Oh, my metabolism has slowed. Oh, I just need some medication. I'm going to be good right after that. So I went to my doctor got the blood work done, was ready to get my medication. And she goes, no, your blood work came out just fine. And that was actually the kick in the gut and and a needed kick in the gut, I think, because I was looking everywhere for the answer as to what was happening to me, except from me. You know, I was looking everywhere else, but within myself, I was a victim. I wanted to be a victim. Did the screen freeze for you all? Yeah, yeah, yeah for okay. Susan. Susan, I don't know if you can hear us. We can't hear you. You're frozen. And I like to talk about that a lot. So, hey, Susan. Yeah. So you froze um, for a second there, and it was after I was the victim. Okay. So, Jonathan, can you, if she can t- carries on, can you fix that for us? Uh, yes, okay. I can cut that okay. out. So I'll, I'll take myself back out. Okay, awesome. So yeah, so we heard you were the victim. 
Okay. Right. Yeah. So I was, I was a vic I wanted to be the victim. I wanted to be the victim of hormones or I wanted to be the victim of menopause or age or any of those things. And I wasn't, I was a victim of not keeping track of my own behaviors. That's what I was a victim of. I was doing it kind of to myself. And the cool thing is what my doctor told me was probably the best news I could have gotten. Right. But I took it as the worst news I could have gotten because now it forced me to look at myself and look at what have I done or not done to, to get me to this situation and what can I do moving forward to kind of improve my situation. And that's how it started, making small little changes, nothing huge, just portion control, kind of just observing, nothing big time. And even with that small change, I started noticing changes. And I, I was working with a trainer at locally at my gym and I thought, man, I really like this. I really want to get into powerlifting. And that's when I decided to hire Jordan Syatt as my coach. And when I started working with him, I think I was 53 or 54 and um, didn't go to him for nutrition help necessarily, but did for, for lifting help. Um, and I listened to everything he said, read everything he wrote, watched all of his videos, joined his inner circle as a member. And I made so much progress just by taking responsibility of what I was doing and looking for sustainable ways to lose weight and get stronger and build muscle. And my life changed. It completely changed. And I was 54, you know, so it's, and it's just been full steam ahead since then. And so my, my message I want to get out there is that it's never too late to change. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how gifted you are, what your genetics are. All of that are just excuses that we all have used in the past, right? It's a, it's, it's you taking the bull by the horns and deciding this is something that I want to change and I'm going to stick with it. And so that's kind of what I, I want to do now. This is my passion is to make sure that everyone knows it's possible. Uh, it's, a, it's such a great story. And I think you really summed it up it's much easier to be the victim. It's much easier to leave the doctor's office and believe that, oh, it's just that you're getting older and you're in menopause now and that's just how life is gonna be and just accept it and just see the pounds start to come on <laughs> year after year and not do anything about it because it's just how life is gonna be. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I love that that's your message. So fantastic, I'm really excited. It's such a great time of year to focus on that yeah. and take that message forward. and start to embrace that and have that as our mantra, right? Like we can do something about this. We don't have to be a victim. So yeah, it's empowering. It's about as yeah. empowering as you can get, right? Knowing that we are all in full control over this. And I know it doesn't always feel like it. I know that because I experienced that as well, but we are. And we, the, the problem I see is that people quit too early. Like they quit after a week or two weeks if they don't see the results they think they should get. Um, and, and so they, they quit too early. And so of course they never see any results, right? Because they never see anything through long enough to see any results. And I think that's really key, um, because we want everything right now. You know, we want to lose the weight right now. We want to look different right now, but the reality is, you know, people ask me when I put up my transformation picture, the before and the after kind of the after is current, but the before they say, how, how many years ago was that? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, a lot. <laughs> and because I don't know, because I didn't keep track of stuff like that. I didn't care. I didn't care how long it was going to take me. I never made note of, okay, this was December, and, you know, 2000 and whatever. I didn't know. I'm guessing by what I was wearing when I was running this race, that that race was about, you know, whatever date it was. That's the only way I know. And, and, and I, I emphasize that because my mind wasn't on timelines or anything or expectations. My my, my mind was on, how can I get stronger? How can I build muscle? How can I get a chin up? Those were what I wanted to know. And when I started doing that, I, the weight took care of itself because I was also dialed in. I was dialing in my nutrition as well, obviously, but I wasn't focused on, I didn't lose any weight. Uh, you know, I didn't care about, I didn't even own a scale to be honest back then. I've owned a scale for about three years now. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Well, you know, I think something you said there, one thing that does change, I think, as we get older, is that maybe in our 20s, we could lose that five pounds to get to the wedding on the weekend, right, in that week, because our metabolism was, you know, ramped up enough to be able to do that if we just, you know, cut the calories for a few days. That changes, you know, we don't see things happen that quickly as we get older, nor do we want them to really, I mean, from a health perspective, we have, it, 
we have to string things together longer to get there. So as we talk about this going into the new year, we know so many of us, so many people make resolutions to lose weight or commit to some type of a new diet strategy. Um, maybe keto, maybe, maybe vegan, they've read about intermittent fasting. Um, but what we know is like 95% of these diets fail long-term, right? And people end up right back where they were or gaining more weight than what they started out to lose in the first place. And it's really sad and frustrating that that happens, but I know you've got a lot of experience with this. So what do you see with your clients? Why do most of these diets fail? And why aren't we able to get the sustainable change that we're looking for? I think, first of all, most any diet will work. They all work. Any of those that you mentioned, every single one of them will work for anybody. The problem becomes what is sustainable for people, right? I mean, we can sustain things for, you know, a minimal amount of time. We all can do that. Um, but to keep things going over the long haul, that's a different story. And I feel like that's the biggest issue with anything that has a name for a diet, you know, keto, whatever. Um, it, it is it is. A temporary thing. And that's how people look at it. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this and then I'm done. Where I think success comes from those that can find a way of eating that is sustainable forever. And, and I like to say this, if you can't see you being a particular way for the rest of your life, then don't bother doing it. There's no point in doing it. Because the weight that you're going to lose quickly, you will not be able to maintain that weight loss because you will not have a sustainable approach, right? So you're far better off going to a much slower process, which can be frustrating at times. I get it. But you're going to be far better off in the bigger picture um, if you do something slower that's more sustainable. And ultimately, you're going to get to your goal faster that way because you're going to be able to be more consistent with it. So I've heard you talk about, you know, the right way to lose weight and the wrong way. And a lot of that has to do with um, making sure that when you're trying to lose weight, that you preserve lean tissue. And I think that's something a lot of people don't understand. So can you explain why it's important when you're losing weight to make sure that that to, to prioritize maintaining lean strength, uh, sorry, lean tissue, so that um or why that's important. I'll let you be, you're the expert, fill us in. Sure. I, I think um, in order to protect our muscle mass, um, protein needs to be a vital component of any kind of weight loss nutrition, right? Um, I know in the inner circle, we emphasize tracking only overall calories and protein because protein is so important for us for what you were saying to help preserve our muscle mass. Because as we age, we've probably started losing muscle mass in our 30s you know, about 5% a decade, maybe not quite that much. It, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like that. Mm -hmm. And so mother nature's already started taking swings at us. And the, the, the thing is, as we get older and into our elderly years, if we don't have muscle mass when we're 70, 80, 90 years old, even, because we're all living so much longer now, um, we're going to be in big trouble. And anybody that has taken care of elderly parents, um, has, has probably seen that firsthand. I have with my own parents, you know, that generation was not as knowledgeable as our generation is. And our generation, um, is, is probably not going to be as knowledgeable as the one behind us. You know, they, they learned a lot of stuff earlier on. So each generation coming up is learning more and more and more. It's going to be in a better place, but for us, it's a matter of preserving and building more muscle mass so that as we age, we can have a functional life. I mean, that's what this is all about. And protein is a key component of that. So many people under eat protein. And so I like to emphasize getting, you know, a certain amount of protein in to help maintain or actually build some muscle because it's not too late to build. That's the crazy thing. Are you going to be a bodybuilder at age 60? You know, probably not, but you can still build a lot of decent muscle mass as you get older. And so getting protein as part of a priority in your nutrition is vital. And, and, and not only from that perspective, but it, it, from a weight loss perspective, it also keeps you feeling fuller for a longer period of time. And so, you know, when you're trying to lose weight, that's always an, an added bonus as well. Mm -hmm. So what about, so in addition to eating protein and, and strength training, what would happen if you didn't? So let's just say um, someone out there decides to drastically cut their calories. They don't increase their protein and they're not resistance training. What could happen to their body composition that then 
helps them to, you know, re regain the weight and then some like what's going on there. They will lose weight for sure. Um, you know, you just eat less than your body needs and you're going to lose weight mm -hmm. and that person will lose weight and, and they'll become what I call skinny fat, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to be, they're going to look thinner. They're going to be a smaller version of themselves, but they're going to look soft. That's how a lot of people characterize it. They're going to have this little bit of belly fat or something. They're still going to have areas that they're not happy with. And they, they're going to get to that point when they reach their goal weight. And they're going to be very disappointed because they thought they were going to have this lean cut body when they didn't do any strength training. They didn't bother with any protein. And so now, you know, they've lost muscle mass in addition to losing the weight. And, and that becomes, you know, again, a big problem. But the cool thing about all of this is you can reverse any of this. You know, that's what's so empowering, right? I mean, muscle mass can help, you know, if, if you want to keep your metabolism going, build muscle, because that's going to be really key. And protein is going to be a key component of that. Build muscle by lifting weights um, and eating a decent amount of protein. But I, I'll tell you, I really feel like um, the lack of education around protein for some people in this age group is, is pretty big, you know, and, and once they get it, it's, it's like life changing. It makes losing weight a little bit easier. They start seeing more strength and muscle from their efforts in the gym. And it's like, wow, you know, it can be life changing. So I just want to clarify. And if someone were to go on a weight loss journey and they, they start restricting calories, because I think what we're saying here is we do have to be in a calorie deficit to lose some weight. I mean, that's, that it, it's not the only part of the equation, but it is a part of the equation. If we did that and didn't increase our protein, or let's say we did increase our protein intake, but we're one of those people that is just hesitant to get in the gym and just doesn't want to deal with the exercise portion of the weight loss. Do we still lose muscle mass when we're losing those pounds from the calorie restriction? Yeah, probably a little bit. Um, it, you know, if you're keeping your protein up, it's not going to be like massive, like somebody who wouldn't, you know, who eats 20 grams of protein a day or something. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it will, th there will be some of that, but, and that person will be, you know, skinny fat to a degree. Um, okay. Their overall health will not benefit though. That's probably a big thing here because um, the fact that they're not trying to maintain any kind of muscle mass or build any muscle mass that will come back to haunt them as they get older, you know, every step of the way, every year, every couple of years, you're going to start noticing weaknesses, um, imbalances, things like that. And then as you get really old, then there's a big price to pay. You know, can you stand up um, um, from a chair sitting down? Can you go up and down steps without your knees hurting? Can, can you lift something over your head to put away in a cupboard? You know, any of those things, the answer is probably going to be no to a lot of those things because you haven't taken the time to try to um, build some strength. And, and this is why I, I feel like strength training is critical. It's critical even more so for those of us as we get older, um, for all of those reasons, just for ha to have a functional life for as long as we possibly can. Just one more question um, on this line of thinking. So, you know, kind of the opposite of, of maybe the avatar that Kristen was talking about. What about the person who want, who thinks they should because they've been told, oh, all I need to do to lose weight, I just need to exercise more and eat less. And by exercise more, they're thinking cardio, cardio, mm -hmm. cardio. What's yeah. the problem with that? Yeah. Well, you know, we all grew up with that, right? Uh -huh. I mean, I, I was one of those people too. And in some ways it's intuitive. Like you, you burn calories when you um, do cardio and you can actually see how many calories you are supposedly burning on your watch, on the machine, wherever. And it's feedback, right? Um, so I get why we all fell for that. Th the odd thing here is that any of those numbers that you're given by a tracker, by a machine, whatever, they're wrong. They're not even, most of the time, they're not even close to being accurate. And so people think, well, I'll just add those calories back in because a lot of these apps tell you to do that. And then they find out they're now in a calorie um, maintenance or even a surplus because they didn't burn 500 calories. They burned really 250, but they ate 500 more, you know? So, so, so there, there's that um, scenario. The, the issue with cardio is, yes, it burns calories. It's not an efficient cardio. I mean, it's not an efficient calorie burn at all. And, and so we could burn 300 calories, let's say, on the elliptical. And, we, and, and it took 45 minutes to do that, let's say. 
we, we could eat 300 calories in a matter of seconds, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't take much. And so we continuously chase our tail with that. But to me, the, even the bigger issue than that is that we don't exercise to lose weight, period. Whether it's cardio, whether it's strength training, that's not why we exercise. And we have to have a good relationship with exercise. We exercise to build muscle, to build strength, to increase our bone density, improve our health, improve our mental health. This is why we do exercise. And that is one relationship over here. If we're doing exercise to burn calories, to lose weight, we are going to be chasing our tail and we'll probably not be successful as a result. We have to have a relationship with food that's over here. It's separate. And, and that is how we lose weight. If we want to actually see the scale go down, it's all going to come from our nutrition. Do we burn calories when we work out? Of course we do. But it's, it's really not enough for us to even con consider in an equation. So those that chase that, I think, are the ones that just spin their wheels entirely, you know, and they keep thinking, okay, I just need to add another day, another day. I'm not working hard enough. I'm not doing this. You know, no, you don't need to add another day. Maybe what you need to do is focus where you need to focus instead of focusing on what doesn't control your weight loss. Let's focus on what does, which is your nutrition. And, and that's an interesting thing because when people talk with me about losing weight and, and the first out of their mouth is, well, I lift five times a week. I do hit twice a week. I run, I do this, da, 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 all these things. And they have yet to mention the one thing that will actually help them lose weight. And that is nutrition. So I have to bring it up. And so that right there is like eye opening to me because people are focused on what I call the passenger of the weight loss car, which is training. The driver of that car is nutrition. So I try to get people to focus on the driver of the car now, because without that driver, you're going nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. So the driver has to be your focus. Training is going to help you get there. Training is going to get you the look you want, you know, it's especially if you lift. Training is mm -hmm. going to get you the look you want. The driver, nutrition is going to get you to the weight you want. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Susan, for keeping Kristen and I in business as nutritionists. So, I love that. I love that you're emphasizing what we do. So I'm curious because, you know, with the whole thing about nutrition, I get asked a lot about intermittent fasting because it's kind of the, the, you know, the trend of the day, I guess it would, we would say. So what do you see with intermittent fasting? Is, is there some secret sauce with it? Is there, is there something magical about it? Where do you see that fitting in or does it? I honestly, there's nothing magical about intermittent fasting and I don't see it fitting in for most people to be perfectly honest. I feel like it's a fad. Um, and, and it, there's no research to back anything up that it is more successful than anything else. Um, like any other diet or way of eating, if you're not in a calorie deficit, it's not going to work for you anyway, but it can be helpful for people with crazy schedules or people that just don't like to eat breakfast because it's been known in our circles as the no breakfast diet, because that's essentially what you're doing if you're just not eating breakfast. Um, but if you consider intermittent fasting kind of a free for all and you do whatever you want, no, it's not going to work for you at all. And I think there's a population that should stay away from it. And that, that population is, is the group of people who have a disordered relationship with food, you know, who might be more susceptible to, to binging um, or who come to intermittent fasting from a past of very disordered eating behaviors. Um, those people, I would say, don't even go near intermittent fasting because it's going to encourage you to save up calories until the end of the day. And it's going to be an all out feeding frenzy. And, and that's where people um, go, go wrong with it. So I'm not really a huge fan of it. Um, I've done it myself. And then I like, and then I thought, you know, why am I doing this? Because I love breakfast for God's sakes at a decent hour <laughs> of the day. So I feel like if, you know, sometimes school teachers, it might work out for them pretty well, but schedule wise, but that's really the only group of people I would even say to consider it, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. And I also see people have a when they go to intermittent fasting, sometimes if they're condensing that window too much, then we really start um, infringing on that protein intake because we're only doing like the two meals a day and to get enough protein in within two meals can yeah. be really difficult because that's a, it's a really big appetite to try oh, to. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I couldn't eat that much in two settings. No way. Yeah. And I really, really like breakfast. 
That would yeah. make me sad to. I know. I know. I don't. I don't understand why people don't. Like Might be my favorite meal. But... <laughs> anyway, so so we've talked about why most diets fail. You know, especially long term, why they're hard to adhere to. And you have such a hopeful message. So let's shift in that direction and let's talk about how to make weight loss easier for for our listeners. So, you know, we know that it's important, you know, Kristen alluded to it as well, that to be in a calorie deficit is super important for weight loss. But there are nuances to that. So, for example, um, the types of food that you choose can make it easier or harder to lose weight. You know, those hyper palatable foods, kind of overdoing it on those can can increase your appetite and kind of make it harder to to stick to a plan, you know, protein is, is obviously helpful. So what are some other strategies that you have for making dieting easier? Well, I I like to tell people some pretty basic stuff and, and I'm stunned constantly by the amount of people that don't do this. Then the first thing that comes to my mind is, um, planning, planning ahead. Most people don't do this. They wing it from one meal to the next, right? So they come home from work. They're tired. They're hangry. You know, they're, they're like starving and their kids need their attention. And there's so many things going on and they have to sit there and figure out, okay, I've got seven, 800 calories for dinner tonight. What am I going to make? And they wonder why they're not successful because who wants to do that? (laughs) No, one's going to do that. You're going to either cook whatever that is there. Are you going to order out or something? You know, I mean, it's, so pre-planning is really key. And I really feel like it's the fat loss hack. It is the best hack that most people don't do. And, and what I envision planning, meaning it's not that you have to cook everything ahead of time, but you can literally plan out your nutrition tonight for tomorrow. Write it on a piece of paper, for God's sakes. If you don't want to use an app, that's cool. I don't use an app. Whenever I track something, I put it in a little spreadsheet. Track it however you want, but figure it out tonight. So when tomorrow comes, you already know how your nutritional day is going to look. You've already done the math. You've got your protein accounted for every single meal. You've got your lunch, your breakfast, lunch, your dinner, and then maybe you threw in a snack in there. Cool. You have it all accounted for. So now you don't have to think. The thinking is already done. And when people get into that kind of rhythm, they start creating go-to meals, you know, meals that they can easily go to in a pinch. They always have the ingredients on hand. They know how to make, they, they, it fits their calories and protein really well. And they really like them. You start developing a little vocabulary for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you can just start cycling through those. And that's what what I see. The people that do that are far more successful. And it's not that hard to do. It might be a little cumbersome at the beginning for people that are new to it. I get that. But man, if you can stick with that, it becomes super easy. Don't reinvent the wheel. Re- revisit these meals. I eat the same three or four breakfasts. I just rotate them. Like I'll be on a pancake kick here pretty soon, you know, and, and then, and sometimes it's an oatmeal with some egg whites and a little bit of protein powder in there for a little extra punch and fruit. You know, I've been on that for a while. So, you know, you, you just kind of switch through things and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, this becomes a whole lot easier. Yeah. And if I could just um, ride on your coattails a little bit with that. So I don't know about you ladies, but one of the biggest questions I get from clients or the biggest comments is, oh, you must be such an amazing cook, gourmet (laughs) chef. I'm like, oh dear, no, no, no. So, but, but I am, what I'm committed to is putting real food on the table every night, but that, that looks like, you know, some chicken and some broccoli and a salad and maybe some sweet potatoes or a piece of fish. Like I always, I always plan it around the protein, but it's super basic. So I think that there's a barrier for people if they think they have to be like Bon Appetit or Julia Child every night. And really, it doesn't have to be fancy. And it's still it's delicious. You know, if, if you just just think more all along, like planning it around your protein and just being simple. So I don't know what, what you guys think about that. Totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. I think people overcomplicate it with recipes. Yeah. You know, I don't remember the last time we ever used a recipe in this house. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's so basic. We, and my husband is pretty much the cook at dinner time here. He's, and I've 
taught him well over the years. You know, he always makes sure we have a protein. He makes a massive amount of vegetables now because with my son here and me, I eat a ton of vegetables. Um, and then it's always, I mean, I love potatoes. So we'll always have a potato or rice or something else. It's basic, but we make it different with spices, you know, yeah. or something like that, just to kind of change things up a little bit. But yeah, the more complicated you make it, yeah, it is going to be harder. I mean, these apps can help you with that. You know, if you have a recipe, you can enter all your information in a lot of these apps and it will save it. And, and then you add up every, you have to measure everything out, add it all up at the end, divide it by servings, and you'll have your info for m moving forward, but you don't have to do that, you know, and you can, you can create, you know, basic meals that taste really good without having to go through the whole recipe thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so we keep talking about the protein thing and building meals around the protein. Um, I understand you have sort of a protein cheat sheet hack. Is that something you might share with us? Sure. Yeah. And I think this is really super helpful and maybe what, maybe the second most important hack I think that there is that people could use. And this is coming from someone who doesn't, I mean, I don't track at all anymore, but it was very helpful when I did. And I don't use an app um, to track. I am old school. It was paper and pencil. And then I graduated to a little spreadsheet on my desk top here. And then um, I created this protein cheat sheet because I was tired of having to look up how much protein in, you know, however many ounces of chicken or whatever. I got tired of that. So I made a protein cheat sheet and it's just a simple spreadsheet. The first column lists all my protein sources that I like, all the ones that I'm going to eat, everything, every kind of meat that I like, fish that I like, um, um, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, protein powders on there as well. Um, and then the next column is I make multiple serving sizes for each one of those. So like for chicken, I would probably have four ounce, six ounce, seven ounce, eight ounce, something like that. Multiple serving sizes. The next column is how many calories are in all those serving sizes. So, you know, Google's my friend. I look them all up, whatever. And then the last column is how many grams of protein is in each one of those servings. So now I have in front of me one sheet. I have all the math done and it's like my template. This is how I build meals, you know? Okay, I want to get 40 grams of protein at breakfast. How am I going to do that? You know, oh, okay, well, eggs have this, egg whites has that. So I can mix those two up together and then maybe have a little oatmeal on the side, put a little scoop of protein powder and boom, I've hit 40 grams, maybe 45 grams of protein very easily. You know, it just makes planning your meals so much easier. That's good. Okay, so another question. Um, and if I had a dime for every time I was asked this, I would be extremely wealthy. <laughs> and it's how, how do I lose the last 10 pounds? Is there any hope for me to lose these last 10 pounds? What do you say to those people? You know, I would, I'll tell people this, if those 10 pounds, five pounds, whatever it is, um, they're, they're always going to be the hardest to lose. As you lose weight, it's harder to lose more weight. That's just how it is. It's like when you're in the gym, the stronger you get, the harder it is to get stronger. And with weight loss, it's just going the other way. I, I'm very honest with people saying, look, if you really want to lose those last five or 10 pounds, you're going to have to be pretty meticulous. You, you know, the wiggle room that maybe you had at the beginning of your weight loss journey is probably not going to be there anymore. Meaning going out with friends and family may not be on the table as much, if at all, depending on the person and their numbers and all that kind of stuff. Um, are you willing to give that up? Are you willing to really have control over everything in, in such a meticulous way to lose these last five or 10 pounds? Or maybe you need to ask yourself this question. Is it worth it to you? Mm -hmm. Is your life going to be dramatically different five or 10 pounds from now? And if you think the answer is yes, then go for it. Absolutely go for it. Because for some people, the answer is undoubtedly yes for a lot of reasons and they just need to roll up their sleeves and buckle up because it's going to be a it's going to be a tough ride and it's going to be frustrating but it's doable right but for some other people the answer may be you know what i don't know i don't know if i want to not be able to do all these things just to lose five pounds you know and so my advice to those people is okay I would rather see you increase calories than get you into more of a maintenance kind of um, setup. And now let's focus on the gym. Let's focus on building muscle because when you start focus, when you focus on building muscle in the gym, 
and maintenance calories, which you can do. It takes some time, but you can certainly do that. You're going to change how you look. Now, the scale may not change, but you're going to change completely how you look over time. And most everyone, that's what they really want. It's not so much the number as it is, oh, you know what? I really want to look a certain way. And so, you know, it, people are different with, with their goals and why they have them and all this kind of stuff. But for a lot of people, the answer is it's, it's not about losing anymore. It's about building now. Mm-hmm. And so we, we get our, our, our nutrition kind of on autopilot in maintenance. And now our focus is over here on our workouts mm-hmm. and really get a good strength program and push yourself in the gym and really focus to build some muscle because that's how that, that's going to change how you look. I love that advice because I will tell people that that fat's fluffy, like a little bit fluffy, and muscle is so much denser. So even if you, you know, to your point, you get in the gym, even if you don't lose weight on the scale, people will tell me all the time, oh my goodness, my clothes are looser. Mm-hmm. I feel tighter. I feel better. And so, so in my mind, they've exchanged body fat for muscle, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially, I mean, yeah. and our bodies handle that. I mean, we don't literally switch them out, but- right. Uh, but, but yes, they, they are building muscle um, and they're losing fat, mm-hmm. you know, and, the, and I think we, we all need to be reminded that when we step on a scale, it's measuring everything, bones, organs, water, tissue, you know, ev- fat, muscle, everything. It's mm-hmm. not just measuring fat, you know? And so I think we get caught up in that, you know, if the yes. scale goes up, oh my God, I gained fat. Yeah. Well, no, you're probably just holding on to a little bit of water. You had a big dinner and it's still half of it's in your stomach. You know, that's why you wait, you know, wait a little bit and your, your weight's going to change. Right. Or if I drink this whole glass of water right here, I'm going to weigh more than I did before we started talking, right. you know? Um, so I think people lose sight of that and constantly need that reminder. But I will say this, cause I understand it. Our generation, we didn't grow up with this whole scale fluctuation talk. There was none of that. It was either the scale went up and that's bad or it went down and that's good. That was it. So we're coming from decades of that kind of thinking. And that's, man, that doesn't go away. We can, we, we can logically work around that, but I don't think it ever goes away. I think it's really hard to break through that, you know? Um, and so it's a constant reminder I put out there to people that, yeah, you know, scale weight and fat loss. I mean, it, we're talking two different things, really. Yeah. So, you know, I wonder if, you know, for those people that are still so fixated on the scale, I wonder if using, you know, some of the newer technology that looks that the scale that has the body mass index on it is a better way of kind of tracking because you can see if you're, you know, the amount of fat is actually declining while the the amount of muscle is increasing, which is really what we're looking for is lean muscle, right? Right. But my problem with that is those are not accurate. And so people get really hung up on those numbers. And it's like Mm -hmm. when people start trying to chase body fat, that to me is a big frustration because, you know, you could go to in body, you can get a DEXA, all these things. None of them are going to, I mean, DEXA is probably the most accurate, but the most accurate reading on body fat is going to be when you're dead and you have an autopsy. That's it. That is absolutely it. That's been shown time and time again. And so when people try to chase body fat, that becomes super frustrating. I feel like I would not recommend anybody get one of those scales that does both because I don't, I'm not sure that it's going to be worth trying to look at all of this stuff. Get a scale that measures your weight and, and maybe you can work with your doctor or, or if you can get a DEXA, if you want to get body fat measurements done every so often so you can see a trend. The number itself may not be accurate, but probably the trends down or up would be Mm -hmm. accurate, you know? Mm -hmm. So if people could take their head out of the numbers game and look at trends, that would be great. But the problem is most people can't do that. Mm -hmm. They get hung up on, I have 25% body fat. Well, maybe you don't, but look at the trend. It's going down, you know, Mm -hmm. but they can't see the trend. They, Mm -hmm. they, they, they only get numbers. So I get, I have real mixed feelings about that because I feel like the scale is hard enough, (laughs) you know, for people to understand what that is. And, and they, they try to compare data day to day, which is a huge mistake. Mm-hmm. They need to collect data for 30 days and then step back and look at your trend from day one to day 31. What are those two numbers looking like? 
day two to day 32. What do those numbers look like? But stop comparing Monday to Tuesday and Tuesday to Friday. And, you know, all we're too much in the minutia and we miss all of, of the positive trends that are happening. Take a step back at the end and look and say, oh, OK, wow, I felt like I haven't lost anything, but I actually lost two pounds this month. My trend line is going down we get so caught up in day to day that we don't even see it. We feel like we're just going up and down the same six, eight, nine ounces, whatever, but we don't keep track of the fact that it's over time, it's been going down, which is what we want. So maybe we stop fixating on all of these little nuanced numbers and we focus on the healthy habits yeah. and how our pants are fitting and <laughs> just enjoy the, the pants life. test. <laughs> A hundred percent. The pants test is the best. And um, I I tell people, you know, use your clothes. Also take measurements like every two weeks and for women, you know, your hips, your belly measurements, those are the best really for us to take because that's where we all tend to carry, you know, the most fat and watch how they move because they're probably going to start going down even when the scale doesn't. And when that happens, you're losing fat, you're doing it right. Like don't, People get so frustrated when the scale doesn't move, but maybe their measurements do. And I'm like, I don't know why you're frustrated. This is exactly what you want to have happen. You're building some muscle, you're building some lean mass and you're changing how you look. Your measurements are going down and your clothes are fitting better. What's not to love? (laughs) Is there an age that we have to start wondering about whether we should be in the gym or not? Or is that yeah, I have clients that are just kind of afraid to to get started after they pass the 60 mark. Like, like they think, I don't know if they think like they're going to fall apart if they, you know, stress their muscles or whatever. But what, what are your thoughts on like, what age is, is there an age that's too late to get started? No, no, there's no such thing. And, and, and I know it can be intimidating. I mean, I think gym intimidation for our age people is a real thing. You know, I mean, it can be scary. Some of these, and I'll say guys, cause it tends to be more guys, these big old dudes in this free weight area, they look mean and bulky and little, they're all actually really nice by the way. You know, they just have this look. Um, but I understand the intimidation and I, I tell everyone this, look, if you're newer to strength training may, or maybe you've never done it, I would hire an in-person trainer to help you. Because learning something like this from scratch on your own at our age is really tough. I would say there's very few people that would be successful doing it that way, right? Um, Because it's going to take initiative. It's going to take drive. It's going to take discipline and research. And most of us, that sounds exhausting, (laughs) you know? Um, So hire somebody at a gym. You have an appointment with this person. Tell the person your goal, whatever your goal is. I want to build strength. I want to be, have functional strength. I want to build some muscle, whatever it is. And let that person take you from the ground floor with some basic exercises and get you more confident where you can go into the gym on your own with your routine that your trainer gives you and you can do it yourself. That's the best way to do it. And I know maybe not possible for everybody, from, even from a financial standpoint, but I, I push back a little bit and say, look, I, I'll bet you for a lot of people, there are other areas in your life that you're spending financially, you know, finances on that you could allocate here. And what's more important than your own health? I mean, there's nothing because without your own health, you really don't have anything. Um, and so I would say hire, not for a long period of time, you don't need it for a long period of time, but enough for you to feel comfortable enough to go in there and do it by yourself. And I think that is the ultimate goal. Mm, two things. So to your point, Susan, on on um, a lot of women, especially are intimidated in the free weight area because of all those, you know, bodybuilding big, big guys. I have to tell you that the other day I was there and there was one of the biggest, baddest dudes of the gym, an older guy. Um, and I, I think he was a professional wrestler. I don't know. He's like super big, badass guy. So he was sitting on a bench. I went over to do an exercise that everybody should be doing, in my opinion, called farmer carries. Mm-hmm. So it's when you pick up 
heavy dumbbells and you do, you walk around with great posture. Mm -hmm. It's just great for the, the whole body. And uh, so I picked up these weights that I could never, ever do anything with. I can't actually lift them other than just carrying them around. So I picked them up and he said, oh, ma'am, would you like my bench? So he was ready to like, you know, break up his work up, workout, get off his bench, give me his bench. And I said, oh, thank you. But I can't actually lift these. I'm just carrying them. <laughs> you could never do a bicep curl or anything. Just carrying them around. And he was like, he didn't know about that exercise. So then he was like, so what are you doing? And why is that for? I'm like such a sweetheart. So yeah. you're right that they, they are the nicest people. And I think because they love working out so much, they're so happy when other people are there and, and interested. So, and, and just one other point, um, for the listeners out there. So Susan, I love your Instagram so much. And, and, you know, it can be intimidating to get started with exercises, but Susan will on her Instagram, you, you know, you have a whole bunch of diff different exercises out there and she'll show you. So this is, this is what I see a lot of people doing wrong. For example, I think you were, oh, you were doing, um, the bicycle, the abs. Oh, um, I did that one today. Yeah. 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 So the, um, the, uh, uh, when you're laying on your back and yeah. you're doing the bicycle, you know, yep. for your abs. And so Susan, Susan showed, this is how, um, I see a lot of people doing it. That isn't correct. And then here's what you can do to make it safe and healthy and get more out of it. So you could even just from home, look up some exercises on Susan's Instagram to get you started. I, I mean, I fully embrace hiring a trainer an in-person trainer, but I mean, just to get started, you're such a good resource. Sure. And, and, and I'll tell other people this too. Another way, um, you know, while you're trying to find a trainer or whatever is, you know, give yourself a goal of doing like 25 body weight squats throughout the course of a day. By the end of the day, you've done 25. Doesn't matter how you break them up, just do them. And then 25 push ups. And you're like, well, what if I can't do a push up? Okay, you put your hands on the wall. Mm -hmm. And you do your push ups from um, a standing position with your hands on the wall. And this, as soon as you can get full range of motion there, you lower your hands to maybe a countertop. And the next time you're going to get your push ups from a countertop. And then when you get stronger there, then you lower them to maybe a coffee table, you know. And then uh, as time goes on, you start lowering your hands to the point where you end up on the floor, right? As opposed to doing push ups from your knees, which no, hardly anyone ever gets off their knees to get to a full push-up. Have you noticed that people are, are doing push-ups from their knees, which is inherently not bad, but it's not as efficient as if you elevate your hands and work pr to progress your hands down to the floor, right? There's a way to track your progress with that. You know, you're getting stronger push-ups on your knees. is just like, you're, you're here forever, <laughs> you know, and you never know when it's, when you're ready to go up on your toes, but when you lower your hands, you know, bit by bit by bit, you are getting stronger and the lower you get, the harder it gets to do these push-ups. So it, it's, it's a great way to track progress, but that's a great way to start too. Just start getting those squats in and getting those push-ups in. Um, and then when you have a trainer, then get going to lifting some weights. So I'm just going to say for our listeners out there that are actually just listening and they're not watching the YouTube if you were actually watching and you could see Susan's biceps right now, you'd be like, okay, I'm starting those push-ups uh, today. <laughs> today. <laughs> I'm not waiting. <laughs> well, I know when, when I knew we were interviewing Susan, I wore long sleeves so I wouldn't feel <laughs> left <stop>. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what might be some other things that contribute to this equation? I mean, we've talked about nutrition and exercise. We know those are two big pieces. But what about some other things, um, sleep, stress, um, consistency, like is the 80, 20 rule. Okay. Can I just do this the, during the week? And then on the weekend, can I just kind of go crazy and do what I want? Um, what are yeah, some no. of the things that <laughs> to this equation? Yeah. You know, consistency is the determining factor of success. That's it. Well, it, 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 nothing will happen if you're not consistent. Consistency looks different for different people. A lot of people can make progress. Like if you were not consistent at all ever, you could be 50% consistent with hitting your nutrition goals during the course of the month and see some progress, right? But as you start seeing progress, you're going to have to up that consistency because it's going to get harder to make progress. 80% is what we tend to see. I like to see that, that as a minimum, right? But depending on the person, how, how big they are, how much weight they have to lose. A lot of factors will determine you may need to be at more 90%, you know, or if you're trying to lose the last five pounds, you're probably going to be a 95% or, or something like that. You know, it's going to have to be pretty high. Um, so consistency is really it. And here's the thing with consistency. 
in our heads, we think we're being really consistent. <laughs> and the reality is, no, we're, we think we're being 80% and the reality is it's more like 50. And for most people, that's not going to cut it. Um, so I encourage people to track their consistency and you do this in the inner circle all the time. Uh, we have a consistency calendar where, um, every day that you hit your calorie goal, your protein goal, you put a big red X, right? That means you, you hit it. You could do a check, whatever you want. Um, if you miss one of the two, you put a big black zero. And so now you have a visual of how many days this week have I actually hit my numbers, not close, but actually hit what I'm supposed to do. And, and this becomes really eye opening for a lot of people, you know, and that includes weekends. And some people will say, well, how do I track, um, calories and stuff when I go out? Well, there you go. This is a problem, right? If you don't know for sure how many calories you're eating, you can't give yourself a red X cause you have no idea. Right. And, and what we have on our calendar is a note section where you can actually write, okay, I put a black zero because we went out to eat and I have no idea how many calories it was. So you remember why I got this black zero. And then you have all of this data saying, okay, why am I expecting to see all these results when I can't even be 60% consistent with what I'm, I'm trying to do here? You know, It's really eye-opening because we always overestimate that. We always think we're doing great. And, and the honest reality is if somebody's been in a calorie deficit for a month or more and they haven't lost anything, guess what? You're not in a calorie deficit. Now we got to figure out why, you know, where, where's that, why aren't you in a calorie deficit? Maybe it's all the, the nibbles and the tastes and, and the mindless eating that happens throughout the course of a day that we don't count because it doesn't fill us up. Right. So anything that doesn't fill us up, it's out of, it's out of our head. It's like a nothing. Right. But that not filling us up was probably 300 calories. <laughs> you know, that's a lot when you're trying to lose weight, you know? So it all matters. And, and I think we, we overestimate all of this. And so tracking consistency, I think is the biggest thing that, that, that you can do. And, and with regards to stress, there's a real mixed message with stress. I feel like, and I, I used to think this too, that if we have stress, you know, our cortisol levels go up and if that happens, Oh God, we can't lose weight. And that's just not true. You know, that's not true what cortisol does and what stress does, it changes our behaviors, right? It changes, it could increase our cravings. It can, um, it, it can make us hungrier, right? But it's our behaviors. That's the issue that has happened from stress, right? It's not the stress itself. It is how we react to stress. That's the problem. And that's a tough nut to crack because everyone's stresses are different. Some are, I'll, you know, massive amounts of stress. Some are just a little bit, whatever, but we need to become aware of how we react to being tired all the time, how we react to a very stressful part of our life. You know, that we're not reaching for the bag of Oreos, you know, that instead of reaching for the bag, we'll, 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 we'll put two Oreos on a plate and go sit down at the table and eat them. You know, we have to be aware of stuff like that because here's, here's the reality. You're still in control of this. You know, you're not a victim to stress. You still control how you react to it, right? But we've got to be honest about it and we've got to be willing to hold ourselves accountable. And that's not easy when it comes to stress, right? And there will be days where people say, screw it. Cool, I get it. You said screw it, you, maybe you overate and, and a lot of people want to call that a binge and it's really not a binge, they just ate a lot, right? They ate a lot. Okay, cool, hop on track the next day. Don't use that as a justification to keep doing it you know, and that's a big problem. You know, you, you fall off the wagon, whatever the wagon is, you know, you fall off or something and then you think, okay, well, I've just screwed it up. I, I mean, I'll start maybe next month, you know, well, no, you didn't screw anything up. You just need to hop back on track the next day because you know, you, you don't make all your progress one day and you don't lose it all in one day, you know? And I think we lose sight of that. You know, I want to, I love what you just said. And there's a lot of power in that because it's, it's really about our perception of stress and our response to stress versus stress itself. Right. I mean, so I think there's a lot that goes along with that, but I want to back up one step before that and go back to the calorie deficit, because what I see a lot, and I just want to get your take on this, just like women in general, or, well, I'm going to say women more than men tend to take things to extremes. So the over-exercising, the overdoing it. When we're talking calorie deficit to lose weight, 
can we overdo that too? Is there like a baseline that we don't want to go below so that we're not hurting our health in some way? Because I think we keep talking about calorie deficit and I see people taking away, oh my gosh, I just shouldn't eat today because that's yeah. how I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Right? So can you just kind of put that back in perspective for us? Sure. I, I feel like this all stems from a relationship with food. Like where's your relationship with food? Um, if you feel like you have to um, eat 800 calories one day because you went out to dinner with your friends and family the night before, um, that's a bigger picture scenario. That That's an issue. And that is, that is a very disordered relationship with what you think food does. And I recommend uh, oftentimes for people, I would seek some therapy for that because there's a lot of stuff behind that, that it's not in my wheelhouse to try to help you fix. Um, but I, I, I will say for everybody, the purpose of being in a calorie deficit or the point of this is to eat as much as you can while maintaining a deficit, not to eat as little as humanly possible and survive. And that's why when sometimes when, when I work with somebody and work up their nutrition numbers, let's say I'm making this number up, let's say their calorie deficit number I want them to aim for is anywhere between 1800 and 2000 calories. I want them there and their jaw hits the floor. They're like, are you kidding? That sounds like a lot of calories. I can't lose weight on that. And, and, and this has ha this happened so much from people that have grown up in, in decades of, I only can eat a thousand calories and lose weight. That's the only way this works for me. And, and what they don't understand a, a couple things is, um, first of all, if they're, if they're not losing weight currently, they're eating more than that number that I gave them anyway. And they are dumbfounded by that. And that just shows you how, how inaccurate we are at thinking in our head, how much we're actually eating. Right. Um, and then other people will say, I can't lose weight on 1200 calories. How do you expect me to lose weight on 1800? And the issue here is those people that say they can't lose weight on 1200, here's what they do. They eat 1200, one, two, three days. Then they start going off track a little bit because who can stay on that low calories for very long? You know, so the little nibbles and stuff start. And then by the end of the week, they're like, well, I've been good this week. I'm just going to go out on the weekends and kind of, as, as you were saying, Kristen, having like this, this free for all on a weekend. And, but in their head, they're thinking, I'm not eating that much. When in reality, they're eating a lot and then they're back on Monday at 1200 calories wondering why, I, why can't I lose weight? They're just in this hamster wheel, right? So all they know is that they're in 1200 calories, but the reality is they haven't been in, in a calorie deficit, you know? So they're in a calorie deficit mindset, but they're not in an actual calorie deficit. And I think that's a, that's a big issue. People think they are because they're thinking about food all the time. They're thinking about counting calories. They're thinking about tracking all of this. So they're in a calorie deficit mindset, but they're not actually in a calorie deficit itself. And that there's a big difference. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the best, um, most succinct ways I've ever heard that put. So the great question, Kristen, Susan, great answer. That was great. So before we wrap up, this is something that we like to ask all of our guests. Tell us how you incorporate what you teach into your own life. What is, what's a day in the life of Susan? Um, so I, I'll be really upfront with everyone say, I don't track calories and everything now. I haven't for years. And I don't think at my age, I will ever probably go down that road again, just because I don't feel like I need to. I put in the time earlier with doing all of that. So now I know how to maintain my weight. I've been in maintenance for years and maintenance is a anywhere from a one to five, six pound bubble, right? You just kind of hover in this bubble. And I've been in my, my bubble's a little smaller. Mine's probably three pounds. I'm in this three pounds. Sometimes I'm at the top end of it. Sometimes I'm at the bottom, but I'm always in that three pound range. So I don't need to track anymore. I know how to eat. Um, and I just want to be upfront with that, but I have done that before, but I plan my meals around protein. And the first thing I'm out of my, in my head is how am I going to get 40 grams of protein in this meal? What am I going to do? And I encourage everyone to do that because that's how I can stay up with keeping with my protein numbers. Um, and then the other thing from a training point of view, I, I work out four times a week, period. I mean, there, it's just it. And, and I really should say it's not really four times a week. I use a four, I lift four day cycles. 
So I'm on a day, off a day, on a day, off a day. I put a day off in between. So it actually takes me longer than a week. So I'm not caught up on squishing everything into a week. I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter if it bleeds into eight or nine days. Who cares? Just keep that consistent workout schedule. And I really walk the walk when I'm in, I mean, I've been injured. I'm injured right now and I haven't missed a workout day yet. You know, and I think that is one of my really current big passions right now is that just because you hurt your shoulder or you hurt your knee or something, you don't stop. There's things that you can find to do in the gym. Your workout may not look the same, but you can still make progress and you still want to make progress. You want to still keep that joint moving. You still want to do all these things. And it keeps your head in the game when, when, when you're injured, because we can get, woe is me. I can't do this anymore. Blah, blah, blah. So get in the gym. I haven't missed a day and I'm constantly, okay. I mean, I've got arthritis in my hip and I got a bone spur for heaven's sake. So there are some days where things I can't do. So now I just find another variation of that thing. And I do that instead. You know, I don't go home and say, Oh, I can't do it. (laughs) You know, I mean, you find what works for you. And I think that's one of the most important things that I do to show people, look, you know, I'm, I'm 62. I, I haven't missed a day. I've been injured. I've had all kinds of issues here and there. And I want to make sure everyone understands that doesn't mean strength training is dangerous. It's just when you're active, that's what happens when you're active in any kind of um, sport activity. Um, and I started jujitsu three months ago, you know, at, at, at my age. So, you know, trying something new, I, I tell everyone, try stuff that's, that scares you, you know, and that scared the crap out of me. <laughs> you know, I was, I was um, terrified and I'm still a little terrified, but I'm learning so much. I love learning a new thing. I love being a beginner. Um, so yeah, those are the kinds of things that I put into practice into my life that I, I encourage everyone else to do as well. This has been such a great discussion. You've, um, you've just like, open the curtains on so many d- different concepts for our audience today. I just love it. So thank you for being so generous with that. I know that our listeners are going to want to learn more from you. Diana's mentioned your Instagram. Do you want to um, share with us some of the resources that you have available that our listeners might go to? Sure. Um, so my Instagram is Susan Niebergall Fitness. I have an extensive YouTube channel, a lot of resources over there. Um, that is Susan Niebergall Fitness. I wrote a book about my story, my my journey, if you will, um, called Fit at Any Age. It's never too late. And it's just essentially all the mistakes I made for decades. And um, most of them will be very relatable um, and how I turned it all around, what I did. And how, how it affected my business life and, and everything else. Um, and that's available on Amazon. And then I have a podcast called the Strong and Lean at Any Age podcast um, as well. You can find that anywhere. Great. Well, I really um, just want to echo what Kristen said about such a great conversation. And I hope that you all, all the listeners out there, really understand the right way to lose weight and that you have an amazing year And you can take everything that Susan's taught us today and really implement that into your life. And can't thank you enough, Susan, again. And thank you, everybody out there for joining us. We can't wait to see you next time. Take care. Thanks so much. It was great to see you guys. If you'd like to access other episodes or subscribe so you don't miss a beat, you can find us at nanp.org forward slash nanp dash podcast. Membership in the NAMP provides you with a competitive advantage. Whether you're a current practitioner or a student, we want you to become an active, informed leader of the holistic nutrition community and join today at NAMP.org. NAMP is very proud to provide the highest level of professional recognition and validation in the holistic nutrition industry through the board certification and holistic nutrition credential. To earn this valuable designation, candidates must demonstrate an exceptional level of knowledge and understanding of holistic nutrition by passing a board exam and documenting client contact hours. Are you ready to boost your credibility with board certification? Visit NAMP.org today to apply. Keep in mind that the information on the NAMP podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical or legal advice. The NAMP is not liable or responsible for any harm, damage, or illness arising from the use of the information contained herein. By listening to the information on this podcast, you agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the NAMP and all agents. Copyright NAMP, all rights reserved.